Hello, good evening, everyone. Apologies for the delay and welcome to this panel discussion on mainstreaming gender across the energy value chain. Thank you to Team Charcha, the Natch Foundation and Rockefeller Foundation for giving us this platform to discuss something that we are collectively as well as individually very passionate about. This panel brings together some of the key stakeholders who have been working actively to include women across the end-to-end -end energy value chains. And they are here with us today to share some of their practical learnings and experiences with us. I'm very pleased to be your moderator for the evening today. My name is Shipra and I work with Shell Foundation. I currently manage Shell Foundation's gender inclusion program, Powered, with FCDO, along with few enterprises uh, that work towards gender integration across energy and sustainable mobility sectors. I would now like to take a few moments to introduce our panelists. We have joining us Atrita Subaya, who is the Energy and Green Growth Policy Manager, working with the British High Commission. Adrita has over nine years of experience and has built her career around climate change mitigation and adaptation with a strong focus on marginalized communities. She currently works with the UK government's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, FCDO, managing bilateral projects across energy security. Thank you for being here, Adrita. We also have uh, Nidhi Pant, a co-founder of S4S, who is a chemical engineer turned farmer turned entrepreneur and who co-founded S4S Technologies, which trains landless women and farmers to become micro entrepreneurs by equipping them with the right combination of technology, finance and market. Thank you for being here, Nidhi. We will have Abhishek joining us. He's facing a few technical glitches, so apologies about that, who is the founder of Greenware with over nine years of experience as a designer, working with artisans, skilling rural communities, and has dedicated a large part of his career to solar charka initiatives. He founded Greenware in 2019 to provide forward linkages to Mission Solar Charka, and we hope he'll be able to join us shortly. We also have Sasmita Patnayak, who's currently the gender advisor for water and energy for food program. And in the past, her work has focused on integration of gender and social equity in policy research and entrepreneurship in the energy access sector, including her work with Powering Livelihoods with CEW. Thank you for being here, Sasmita. We are very excited to hear your insights. So as you would have noticed, our panel is intentionally structured this way because we would like to get three very unique viewpoints today. One from our donors, Secondly, from our program architects, and thirdly, from the social entrepreneurs themselves on why they believe in investing in women and how they make it happen on the ground. We'll try to go a little deeper and talk about few real practical strategies and stories from the ground to keep this very real. And we will be taking questions towards the end. Feel free to add them in the Q&A chat box. Gender inclusion is mission critical to Shell Foundation, given its relevance to both business growth as well as development impact. Over the last four years, Shell Foundation and FCDO have been working together on Powered, which is a unique first of its kind program, which is fully focused on promotion of women in the energy value chain, but not just as end users or livelihoods, but as micro entrepreneurs, as founders and as leaders. This program has been great success with FCDO. And at this point, I would like to invite Adrita to understand, Adrita, what makes it a compelling case for FCDO to invest in gender? Thanks, Supra. Hopefully I'm audible. Yeah, so thanks for your question and a big thank you to the organizers for pulling together what's been a really exciting platform so far. Uh, I'm glad to see all the panelists that you have for our session. They're all familiar faces and organizations that we work with. Uh, just quickly for the benefit of our audience, the FCDO or the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office uh, are mandated to deploy a large part of the UK's overseas development budget. So this is uh, traditionally seen as an aid budget. 
Um, so as you can imagine, gender is sort of central, um, central area of focus for us in India and in all of our projects abroad as well. Uh, we see gender equality as a shared global challenge and one if addressed, which will bring huge benefits to economies and societies, uh, especially in the context where we're building back from COVID-19. Uh, gender equality is critical for delivering better and more lasting results across all the sustainable development goals. It can help accelerate economic growth and prosperity. So it's really something that we see as an opportunity to work in. Uh, there's growing evidence that it helps increase climate resilience amongst the most vulnerable communities. Uh, and if all of this sort of wasn't compelling enough, our work is guided by the International Development Act. So all of our programs have to be assessed from a gender perspective and work towards reducing poverty while also reducing inequality between different genders. Um, and so generally FCDO works um, across different pillars within the gender equality space. Um, we work on girls' education. Uh, we work on ending violence against women and girls, uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights, women's economic empowerment, and women's political empowerment. Um, I think a great example that sort of brings uh, to life everything that I just spoke about is, is the POWER program, which you also alluded to. Uh, so POWER stands for the Promotion of Women in Energy-Related Enterprises for Development. Uh, this is a co-funded partnership between Shell Foundation and FCDO, which has been in operation since 2016. Uh, the program is centered around four goals, focusing on each aspect and level of the energy value chain. The first one is to increase jobs for women across the energy value chain, uh, create and support women-led energy micro-enterprises, uh, support early stage women-led energy startups to create role models at a leadership level, um, and, and undertake research, generate evidence to influence key stakeholders in the sector. I think powered over the last um, you know, three to four years that it's been operational has been catalytic to both gender inclusion in energy and mobility in India. Uh, in terms of impact, we're very proud to say that so far we've created close to 8,000 women micro entrepreneurs and jobs for women. Uh, we're now at a stage where learnings and research from the program are starting to influence key stakeholders in the sector, even at the policy level. And, and we're keenly looking out for like-minded par partners within the sector to help us grow the program. So in a nutshell, that's essentially how FCDO has approached gender in the sector, how we make it sort of central to our programming, and just one example of a great program that we're implementing with Shell Foundation. Hopefully that answered your question, Shipra, back to you. Thank you so much, Adrita. And thank you for also taking the role less traveled and pioneering the cause before a lot of uh, donors and investors stepped into it. Um, I think uh, generating those 8,000 uh, micro entrepreneurs as well as jobs for women was not an easy task, right? It was done collectively hand in hand with the enterprises, uh, testing out various gender strategies, reiterating them again and again and again against market barriers till we actually found the right fit and, and how it works, right? A lot of learnings have come out of this uh, that are supporting um, not just the future enterprises, but also the policy environment in India. And one of the key learnings uh, that also has come out of the program that dedicated funding combined with support for capacity building can be truly catalytic for gender inclusion, especially in a lot of early stage enterprises that want to uh, champion this cause. And we have S4S today here with us who has, you know, made this a reality. Uh, Nithi, can I invite you to share briefly with us a bit more about what S4S does and also share uh, what aspects of the support that you receive from the donors do you think were truly catalytic to the growth of S4S? Thanks. Thanks, Shipra. Good evening to everyone. Um, S4S stands for Science for Society. We uh, So every intervention that we do is focused on scientific interventions for more, more marginalized communities. Um, when we act, uh, initially started, uh, we definitely had an objective of how we can have enhanced income for landless women farmers and graduate them to be micro entrepreneurs by setting up micro food processing units. And we were really inspired by the success stories of uh, Papar and the pickle industry that most of the unorganized sector was doing. 
uh, to, to, to just come back on what Esper has done today. So we help women graduate to become micro entrepreneurs by equipping them with the right combination of finance, market linkage, and technology. So we work with the women, create my, uh, so small farm factories, and then buy back the produce and sell it to the food and beverage industry, which includes likes of large packaged food companies like Nestle, Unilever, Marico, Sodexo, Indian Railways, and small hotel restaurant catering industry, where in, uh, in some of the products you would see the processed food, food ingredients by our micro entrepreneurs that include Sezwan chutney by Chings, Safola oats uh, that most of the people consume, Maggie noodles. So these are some of the products which are proudly manufactured by our micro entrepreneurs at the farm gate. Uh, coming back on how we were really inspired by the success stories and have this hypothesis that women can definitely uh, be engaged in more processing work at the farm gate because most of them don't uh, have uh, are not qualified as farmers they are not able to leverage more and more uh, government schemes policies and are working just as laborers in different farms we are talking very specifically about women uh, smallholder women farmers and uh, or they don't have any other livelihood options they, uh, they they have to leave their villages and travel out of the village in search of uh, gig of works that that uh, that we say either in cotton plucking or temporarily in in some of the seed factories and the income is always fluctuating and there is no way in which they get a, a constant assured income and that's where our uh, we this was our hypothesis that we can create more livelihoods by setting up uh, micro food processing units and have women uh, in be engaged in this work this was an hypothesis and that's where the catalytic funding from fcdo and shell foundation was instrumental in helping us lay the foundation of our business model today so it helps us pilot different things uh, in, in three major sec, uh, areas, which include technology, access to finance, and also market linkage. So people had various doubts that, OK, these women are not edu educated. How will they actually operate uh, machines? Will they be intimidated, in, intimidated by these machines? Uh, they don't know how to read and write. Will they be able to get the quality standard that uh, most of our large uh, companies that we uh, have as market linkage partners, will they be able to meet their quality standards? They are so stringent. Uh, and also, there are so many complex cultural barriers that they have. They need to take care of elderly care. They need to take, take care of child care. Uh, will, they will, will they be dedicated uh, enough to do this? But uh, through this funding, we were very, we were able to test the model uh, with 200 uh, women entrepreneurs and today we are uh, at uh, almost reaching 1000 entrepreneurs and we did this by three things first is we made the technology very centered to women uh, so they don't have to lift anything they are not intimidated by things it works on solar uh, so they don't have there are no moving parts there were small challenges like in in the field people used to tell them that oh they have the, these women have these big machines so any every time there is a power cut they used to say that these women should be blacklisted from the uh, from the village because they are using these big uh, instruments but uh, we did have uh, to go through a lot convincing the entire stakeholders so you need to get the buy in of sarpanch the uh, you need to get an noc from the uh, uh, the villagers uh, where we villages villagers who are in that area give them that awareness so both going through that cycle of technology development was so critical keeping the women at the center that they uh, there needs to be no laborious work they don't need to lift and shift most of the things uh, in this villages different difficult to find any um, in any garage where if there is if the machine breaks down what will these women do they don't so it needs to be a very productized in a manner where that uh, it it's very easy and simple for women to operate and that's where uh, we first did the technology development and then the second most important challenge was uh, to have market linkage uh, precursor the financial inclusion these women were all new to credit they don't have capital to invest on their own they have uh, it's their they have to take that permission from their uh, male members of the family the male members 
don't want to invest uh, the to 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 procure the machine they don't want to invest that amount uh, they have their own doubts that you know will the, uh, what will be the continuity of of this so it was very important to have the market linkage annual contracts with our buyers so we know that today we can go to these women and say that this we will assure you a work for 10 to uh, 10 months at least and you would uh, in annually get an assured additional income of 1000 to $1500 this is a very uh, catalytic amount for these women as this is enough for them to actually come out of poverty in some uh, some areas where there is the increase in the income is at least 50 to 200% and the third important and the most critical part was the access to finance uh these women don't have any land holdings it either goes to their brothers or it goes to their husband uh on what collateral will they actually get the loan they are new to credit they don't have bank accounts there is no credit history on what basis will the bank lend them so it was important to have that cash flow based funding with the go to the bank develop that model where as far as will be the guarantor of work as well as if the women fails to procure the uh, process we would we would have the right to deploy it to some uh, uh, the other micro entrepreneur and uh, also uh, give a guarantee uh, in the process that we will be able to buy back the machine if if this does not work so these were very uh, foundational pillars of our business model which would have not been achieved if we did not have support from shell foundation as well as fcdu and today uh, we have, we are so proudly able to say that our entire supply chain is women not operated whether it is procurement or processing we work in 168 villages in aurangabad odisha uh, in maharashtra odisha and in uttar pradesh and we are close to 1000 micro entrepreneurs just in processing and other 168 uh, micro entrepreneurs who are procuring this produce and it is completely women operated they are it is integrated with technology uh, it's uh, they can operate both digital tech as well as the hardware and uh, this has been a great journey for us and uh, we thank uh, both shell as well as fcdo for that support that's really a very heartwarming story nidhi uh, as to how far you have come and i'm sure the impact that you've made on the ground will probably be sustained through generations uh, of these women right to go i think what i found really interesting is one is to make this happen it required a lot of patience um from time from capacity from funding from all the fronts um that is that you say is very important and the second thing uh, that i really liked what you said which a lot of enterprises miss is you really incorporated your end user which is the women in the design of your operations in the design of your equipment itself because the person who has to use it has to be involved at that stage with which many enterprises miss that and i also quite like how you've taken an ecosystem approach so it's not just about providing the product but also providing a market linkage sustained guarantee of income as well as access to finance to make it affordable for them right so i think there are lots of good learnings um, uh, from as for as for various other enterprises to look at i would also like to understand from you in your experience and your opinion what has been the business value of uh, gender inclusion did you see that by having more women as sales agents as managers across your value chain did it impact positively impact the value, business value proposition for us uh definitely what has been catalytic is that if you see uh, any central facility you would have a male operator operating the machines you have a central unit where uh, there are uh, mostly operated by males and uh, people are pr uh, processing the produce in our case we have to redesign everything from r and d uh, we have to approach things in a very different manner and how it created ba business value for us is that it we are more efficient uh 37% more efficient than a centrally operated uh, unit and that is due to a combination of capex reduction opex reduction as well as procurement strategies which are which we have designed co created with our women and it is only po uh, possible uh, with them so apart from being more competitive having the reliability of supply having the quality of the produce 
uh, this has been uh, th this is the business value that integration of gender has brought in we all know that women are more sincere they are um, in terms of at least food processing uh, they know what that something that they would not eat, they would not give it to any customer. So they are more sensitive towards it. Also, they are more diligent in uh, in taking care of the equipment. Also, what specifically what we are seeing now is that it is helping us move more upper in the value chain, where we are doing more specialized products, where the, the value addition is significant. So uh, there is at least six x to ten x of that additional value created we are going more complex so we are making starches we are all also attempting to make alternate uh plant-based pro uh, plant-based products so it is helping us derive more margins and also create a uh, value for uh, the other stakeholders of of s4s which is the shareholders uh, the customers so it's this is all possible because of the integration of uh, the women in the in the supply chain, we are moving to more and more specialized products and driving more higher margins in the process. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Nidhi. I would like to just change uh, the conversation slightly now and move towards the program portion of it. Uh, what is the role that uh, incubators, accelerators can help play in enabling enterprises like S4S, like Greenware, to meaningfully integrate gender within their enterprise growth plans. Um, Sasmita, may I please invite you to share some of your learnings through your prior experience with Powering Livelihoods at CW and what you're doing now with Water and Energy for Food. How do you think can we systematically integrate the gender lens within an enterprise growth plan? Thanks, Shapra. Thanks for having me today. and. Uh... Thank you for everyone who's uh, who's taken time out of their Saturday evening to um, hear these stories. Uh, thank you, Nidhi Adrata, for those inspiring conversations. I think uh, this is a space that grows from these conversations. So I'm glad that you had a session on something like this. Um, based on my experience to answer your question, Shapra, I think uh, the first thing that programs need to start doing is integrating gender as a very strategic objective of the program so whether it's uh, it it's agriculture or uh, whether it's uh, healthcare no matter what the sector uh, the gender lens needs to be integrated as a strategic um, output of the program or uh, outcome of the program um, and and that's important because uh, no matter what problem you pick up in the world it affects women as much as it affects men sometimes even more and we are talking about 50% of the population. So to not have that lens in itself is like a disservice to the development agenda per se. Um, that's the uh, development side of it. From the business side of it, again, as a entrepreneur or as a program which wants to scale businesses, uh, you can't afford to miss 50% of your potential market. Uh, so again, from a business sense, it, it, it's just like, uh, it's the no-brainer that you need to kind of integrate that lens. So I think having that gender lens strategically integrated in the program is the first thing. Second would be to any target would need budgets to be able to execute that goal. So creating space for that budget. And I think um, these programs that are now coming up, uh, thanks to donors uh, who have thought strategically about it, like Shell Foundation, FCDO, and in B4F, we have CEDA and USAID, uh, who have thought that this needs money. We can't expect innovators or entrepreneurs to uh, do this without having access to the capital, um, and, and strategically bring that into programs. So I think that, again, becomes important. Um, third, again, is the program process. Um, starting from how you onboard our entrepreneurs into a program, uh, to how you design their uh, um, the expansion strategies, the plans, uh, how you provide the funding. There has to be a gender lens integrated along the entire chain. So we can't expect businesses to be gender inclusive when programs in their processes and thinking uh, can't bring that. So we also have to, uh, in, your, in your evaluation parameters, in your monitoring and evaluation, uh, when you're looking at data for e either innovators or the program, you have to bring in that gender lens 
um, into the way the programs are designed and, and thought through. That basically means integrating it in every process that you have. And uh, this goes a long way because towards the end of a program or even uh, as you start working very closely with entrepreneurs, you see it becomes like a norm. Uh, then it, it doesn't feel like it's it's a new concept that has been brought in. It just culturally becomes like a default. And that's the idea, right? Uh, because uh, if you think about it a few decades ago when um, people thought of bottom of the pyramid market as a market, uh, that idea was also new at some point. And people thought, oh, I mean, is this going to work? Like, can you think of legitimate markets uh, in, in areas or among people who, who live live at, say, less than $2 a day. But the uh, models and the markets and the ecosystem today has proved that it's possible. Similarly, when we, we talked about microfinance or lending to the poor, um, there was that doubt, right? Like, is it going to make sense? Will, will the most poor people be able to use a loan productively? And today we know that uh, microfinance has worked and it's definitely helped achieve some of the goals that we wanted to. So I think in the same way, we need to integrate it along the programs to make this like a default. And uh, as long as we can do that, I think in a few years, uh, this will very much become like an essence of programs or how we think about businesses or how we kind of conduct um, very various activities, uh, whether in a program or in the business. I hope that answers some of yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Sasmita. Are there any key challenges that you would like to highlight uh, that you have faced in making this happen? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, of course, there are challenges. Uh, and I think uh, they also teach you uh, a lot in terms of lessons uh, and help you improvise uh, even like as you're designing the program or as you're working with, uh, with the program. Um, so... I think one of the challenges is to um, acknowledge firstly that not all entrepreneurs are going to be at the same level of uh, uh, both understanding as well as interest to integrate this gender lens. So how do you meet each entrepreneur mid halfway? Uh, that differentiated approach becomes very important. Um, it goes a long way. If an entrepreneur is personally motivated, somebody like Nidhi who wants to make this happen uh, adds to what you're doing. Uh, but there are others where market models may not be very convenient for integrating women. Uh, there could be other barriers for the entrepreneurs. And, and bringing that empathy there and trying to meet them halfway and then curating some of these approaches to meet their long-term targets uh, help. Um, but the, but of course, to begin with, that requires a lot of convincing, that requires a lot of conversations. You need to have that patience. Um, you cannot bring in a very uh, conventional donor grantee equation to the table because otherwise you are doing a disservice to the entire cause. Uh, somebody will pick it up, they will execute it for the sake of just executing and then there won't be like a long term uh, sustainability to it. So uh, those conversations, that patience becomes very important. And sometimes programs don't offer you that luxury. You're very like, oh, in, in six months, I have to reach this target. And in two months, I have to finish this. Uh, so I think that flexibility or having donors who understand that is, is very, very uh, important because everybody takes their own time to meet these targets. Um, the other thing I feel is important is having buy-in across the um, uh, across the staff, uh, not just within the companies but also within the program. Having like everybody, including senior members of the of the program, the directors, the leaders who kind of uh, guide the program strategy, believe in this because uh, if we we don't believe in it internally. How are we supposed to make people outside believe in that idea? So it has to be seamless within. Uh, and I think sometimes uh, there could be like differences in how people see the idea of gender inclusion. So I think there's a lot of investment that needs to be done in building capacity of the program teams themselves, uh, taking them through that process, helping them understand how they can come in. And sometimes it's also about uh, very practical steps of like, how can I be an ally? Like, I don't know how do I support this uh, because I'm not the person really going and doing things out there. So, but but I can still be like contributor to this entire cause. So, how do we 
build that kind of capacity within the team and that's something that again needs to be built into the program architecture you need to be prepared that this can happen um and then uh, i think one of the other challenges i feel is uh, around the sustainability of these interventions like when you work through a program i think certain programs bring a very strong impetus to work on gender uh, but how do you make it a culture for the organization uh, the businesses that you work with that this sustains and continues even after the program is over so uh, I, and i think for that you need to work with the pro not just with the founders or the ceos but also the program teams uh, sorry the uh, entrepreneur teams uh, and sometimes people who are like your marketing head in a company or your sales head in a company needs to understand why this is important and how they can uh, build this culture in the respective spaces that they operate uh and and when you integrate it into that institutional memory for for these companies then you can hope that this sustains and goes even beyond your program uh, because at the end of the day that's that's the goal so yeah i mean i kind of try to also answer a little bit towards like how we mitigate these challenges but broadly i would say these first thank you sasmita very valid point around not just making the impact but also sustaining it right sustaining livelihoods are i think equally important as creating livelihoods is uh now we know something very unique hit all of us uh, last year with the pandemic and we all realized that women were uh, more hit compared to men uh, when when the pandemic hit all of us um we got a stark reality check when women's job became almost twice as vulnerable as men's job due to rise in household responsibilities and unpaid care a lot of women withdrew themselves from the workforce uh nidhi uh, what was your experience how did you sustain that impact on the ground when we were hit by the pandemic are there any real women stories uh, that you would like to share with us uh definitely uh thanks shipra for asking uh two major things that we saw one was more on the model uh which was farm gate and decentralized food processing where uh these it was difficult for people to uh move but uh the women were able to operate this on their own we didn't have any field managers staff or anything and they and that was the first testimony for uh for what the team has done which was that these women were easily been able to operate without any help and they were able to do different and different products uh firstly it helped us uh, also understand that food security is also so important uh, during uh, covid and uh, the farmers were really panicked what should they do with their produce and that's what uh, that's where the dryers uh, drying systems really came into use where they could store the produce and use it for their own consumption so for first six months we saw that the women were giving uh, from the three batches that they do two they were selling to us that was actually the only source of cash flow for them and one they were one part they were using for their own consumption so two major intervention we saw was that the women were running the household financially uh, men were back they were their husbands were usually uh, just uh, gig workers laborers uber drivers so they were back from uh, back to the villages and they were looking for alternate income options and they were helping the women to process the produce so uh, first was that these women were running the household they were contributing to the cash flow and second was this was uh, and through this income they were able to support their kids who wanted to pursue their education also so uh, uh, some of them actually uh, had some constraints uh, so they could not send their kids or their kids could not su sustain in the city but with this cash flow now uh, they could give to their kids uh, their kids were working in the were working but that had also stopped so they they were the only person in their entire family who was bringing that money in so more and more uh, decision making they had they found a new identity uh, somehow very quickly during covid that accelerated really fast that they were now the decision makers uh also and second was for their own consumption uh, food security is such an important part that uh, some sometimes we just take it 
so much for granted that women are just required to cook but how what how difficult it is for them to access raw material which is also important equally important to have a nutritious diet uh, that's where the entire model and the drying system uh, came into the picture and this was the two major impact that we saw uh, that women were uh, running the household financially in second but they were also contributing uh, what they were making they were also eating on their own so they were also securing that that produce for their family so uh, this was our experience thanks for the opportunity to share this thanks nidhi i think these were difficult times for all businesses and uh, it we also i noticed we have a question which we will probably take your opinion in as well towards the end as to how do you balance the gender impact with business outcomes especially in dire circumstances like this so based on i think what i've heard um, we realized that this is a difficult journey it, it requires basically various actors of the ecosystem to collaborate gender inclusion is something that requires patience it requires capital it requires capacity building technical assistance customized strategies and champions who can actually embed this within an enterprise for a smooth implementation i would like to invite adrita's views on your experience through powered and other gender related work that fcdo is currently leading or involved in what would be your advice adrita to other donors or and investors who wish to do something more in gender inclusion but are still trying to understand where to start let me turn my mic on yeah thanks shipra so uh, on this question you know we get asked that a lot because um as fcdo formally as difid we've worked a lot in the sector um and people kind of come to us and say you know it, it's it's a need that we see but how do we get started where do we start uh and i think something that we always tell them to do is to just you know do a quick um gender analysis and i know analysis makes it sound like a very um sort of complicated process but by analysis i mean you know just speak to uh the experts on the ground speak to women's rights organizations who have been uh you know fighting for for rights based justice uh, across the country for years on end who really understand um you know what the needs are on the ground and and get a sense of where you can truly add uh value to the space um data data is a big um you know a buzzword today and something that we all lean on a lot so where possible access that data try and crunch a few numbers try and understand um you know where the gaps are where again you can add value um and then as sasmita and both nidhi said that you need to make it central to whatever you're doing so you know it shouldn't just be an add on to another program uh but really be mainstreamed into whatever you're doing be it a climate program be it uh, an en energy program so i think once you start to understand where you're adding value just make that central to everything that you're doing um i think one thing that we forget to do in implementing uh, gender programs is we forget to address the practical needs of women and girls Uh, and by this i mean you know we were running an enterprise program we were really pushing women to um start to look at you know taking loans starting their own business without really understanding that you know they do have these other roles that they play be it as a mother be it as a homemaker uh, you know a lot of traditional roles that in in many times they want to continue with so how do you address those and make it easier for them them to then um you know look at entrepreneurship look at income generation without giving up those uh traditional roles that they may want to continue so just looking at it in a very holistic way is really really important um and i think uh, sasmita and and uh, nidhi both said this as well just involving women in program design um so at every stage you know if you're talking to um Uh, organizations working on gender rights include them in the program design uh, if if you're building a business model include the end users within that uh, design of either the products or or the business model itself uh, and i think the other really important point is to work with communities so it's not only the women that you need to convince but often it's also the men in their families um it's also the leaders within their communities that you need to convince that you know hey this is something that can be done in your community and there are benefits to be seen 
Um, another point that I want to make is that whatever we do in this space, it really needs to be meaningful. Uh, and that's something that we've tried to do through the Shell Foundation partnership through Powered is to focus, you know, not just on um, smaller income generating opportunities, which, which may be an easier sort of problem to tackle, but to actually look at something much bigger, uh, such as starting a micro enterprise. Uh, which requires, you know, tackling a lot more of the social norms and other structural uh, issues and challenges that you face. So try and make whatever you do really meaningful. Um, and I think if if you're trying to achieve scale within the sector, it's really, really important to work uh, on political commitment. So work on policies, work on changing laws. Um, that should be the ultimate sort of aim if, if you're trying to sort of tackle scale. So those are just a few of the points that, uh, you know, I would like to bring up for something like this. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that, Atrika. I specifically um, also really like the point that you made around looking at the data. And I think more and more enterprises are now being encouraged to have sex disaggregated data as well available that helps us track within the value chain, where are the women located, where they are present, where they're absent, and how are they interacting with it, right? And I think that's essentially the first step um, to include uh, a gender uh, inclusion strategy. Um, let me just check if uh, Abhishek uh, has joined us. Are you able to hear us, Abhishek? Uh, yes, yes, Shipra. Hi, welcome, welcome to the panel. Thank you. Yeah. I'm extremely, extremely sorry for the delay and go up. No, no worries, no worries. We are all working from home. We are all excused. It's the technology to be blamed, yeah. <laughs> so I think you've joined us at the right time. And uh, I was actually very, very keen to understand your point of view. Uh, while a lot of CEOs and decision makers in clean energy companies, they try to understand uh, that gender is important. And some of them also try to invest some of their efforts in. Um, still, we don't see a lot of evidence of this happening on the ground. Specifically in India, the workforce participation rate for women is uh, declining over the last few decades, right? But you have been trying to break few gender stereotypes through the work that you're doing in greenware by placing more women in male-dominated sectors like loom operators. So may I invite you to tell us a bit more about what greenware does? and also highlight few practical steps uh, that you took to include women in your value chain. Yeah, all right. So uh, see, our uh, journey started from uh, spinning, uh, which is the yarn production following the concept of khadi, uh, where you know it is decentralized uh, production of fabric, yarn, and garment and localized uh, economy, like, you know, barter system, you are giving yarn to someone and they are giving you something in return. But uh, in that scenario, the real challenge now was the speed or the productivity and the earning of women. And majorly by basic fact of it was, uh, it was run, run by women force of rural India. So here, uh, once we realized the potential of solar charkha, like, you know, when you reduce drudgery with the same concept, uh, charkhas are installed at household level only and uh, women are provided with the raw material regularly they can work on us so once we got the yarn we started working on the fabric development we realized that you know majorly in the areas of uh, up and bihar from where we come from uh, women do not work as uh, you know main fabric producers however they are involved in the entire value chain preparing the yarn for weaving processing the fabric or checking the fabric afterwards, then we realized that, you know, why don't we make them loom operators so that they can come on front, they can run, they can know uh, their machine, they can run, run them through. And that's when we realized to train a few women uh, in Lucknow and Barabanki in Uttar Pradesh, where we are currently working. And uh, it worked pretty well for us. And then we realized is that you know they are pretty much up for uh, this job work and same thing happened with the garment construction unit which we had because most of the tailors were men and uh, in industrialized sewing machines uh, it is uh, you know uh, the, the regular conception is that it, it can only run by women and uh, 
women are usually in finishing areas or where you know thread cutting or some of the hand work is happening uh but when the lockdown happened uh we we saw a surge in artisans coming back from the industrial areas the regular industrial areas to their villages and then women upheld their command because we started with giving them work at their household and then we started inviting them to our garment manufacturing unit so their uh, you know their confidence their participation we were we were always you, you would say you know excited or surprised not excited but surprised that you know how they are able to handle these things uh, which we we thought that they could not uh, also when the lockdown was lifted then we saw that uh, most of our male ka carriers male uh, tailors uh, you know left the job again in, uh, and they, they started going to uh, ncr reasons for you know search of new places or new jobs because they already have been working but women never left us so uh, you know this uh, made us realize that you know if we invest in women power more or if we you know try to give some more time in training them we can find our regular uh, artisan base over here and we can provide them regular uh, income visa ways so that's what we uh, figured out here in past two years specifically thank you for sharing that um what is your vision with uh, with green wear where do you want to take it and what do you think are the key challenges on the way uh okay so we would like to uh start with uh, whatever we had been doing procuring yarn from solar chark artisans on ground uh and we want to just a uh, scale up this uh, entire pilot which we have done and now we are confident that we would be able to do it so in next 5 years we want to involve 5000 women spinners on ground uh from whom we will be procuring uh, yarns home spun on solar charkhas and out of those women uh, uh whatever yarn we are getting then we will set up the entire textile value chain which is totally running on a renewable energy resources and in decentralized manner so uh you, we would say that those 5000 women uh, will be uh, contributing job of direct indirect 50000 artisans in total in the entire value chain starting from spinning to the retail sector uh, this is what uh, our mission is uh, basically and uh, we envision that you know uh, in future textile industry which is the second largest polluter in the world after oil and gas uh we would be able to put very small contribution into it to reduce the carbon footprint which our industry fashion industry is causing uh and you know here uh if we talk about uh, the category the product category which uh, you know with policy advocacy with niti ayog we could recognize it as solar vastra through kvic khadi and village industries commission so this particular category is pretty new for consumers so the market development is one thing and the market awareness is another thing which uh, we feel that you know we need a lot of work and a lot of uh, contribution from others as well uh, needed from thank you for uh, your thought provoking uh, uh, inputs there abhishek i would just uh, take the opportunity to also jump into the questions uh, because i think some of them are partially answered um one is around some examples of gender inclusion strategies that you applied to include wo- more women what worked in the past i would just invite abhishek and nidhi if you would like to contribute any thoughts towards this uh for us it was very important to recognize that equity is the word that we need to give people uh, where they are understand what uh and treat people differently different people could have different circumstances a lot of times just treating people equally without even segmentation is very uh, is very difficult and that's where a lot of times we are deploying technology resources financials um financing but not knowing what they need is uh so equity is the was the word for us so that's how we integrated gender is to is to also assess where each woman was in in her journey and also treat them 
yeah, someone needs more capacity building they need four times training sometimes with uh, with one or group training individual training things don't happen so be having that lens of equity was important and that's where we uh, that's how we have implemented and second is that a very top down approach which is our board uh, as well as investors our uh, other stakeholders customers getting all of them at on one page and also helping them recognize that what is this bringing for each one of them uh, was very important and um, everyone champions the cause in our organization starting uh, from uh, our investors they are invested in this so they realize that uh, it's 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 a long journey things some things we have to do differently our cost structures would be different our team structures would be different uh, so these were the two things that that we did and we also got a lot of support from shell foundation and fcdu in this process having value for women integrated we did some specific um, projects which were designed to integrate more customers having them that awareness that the entire traceability in the supply chain is happening and they now can uh, also benefit from it how they can actually leverage uh leverage uh, the processing that is done by women and create value for for them so uh, managing both the level of uh, at both the ends both at customer and as well as uh, the women and it was important to know that equity is w what we are uh, is is our strategy to implement various gender interventions that's very powerful nidhi thank you for sharing that Uh, Abhishek, any thoughts on this? Yeah, I completely agree with Nidhi. And uh, see, here also, uh, when uh, we realized uh, in our journey with Solar Chalk and Solar Looms, uh, you know, uh, making them the owner of uh, this entire uh, set uh, was something which was uh, the break point, breakthrough point for us, where you know their ownership is uh, decided, the equity is decided. and uh, uh you know and and the training hand holding at each and every stage uh, for us uh, we thought that you know the quality uh, assurance in in such decentralized manner as production would be uh, pretty challenging for us but uh, later on uh, you know with exposure of what is going to happen with their produce in future and what is the importance of that in future it uh, we did not need to give a particular you know a uh, book based training to them they were uh, once they were aware they were sensitized so you know ensuring ownership sensitizing them uh, time to time uh, wherever it is needed and uh, providing them regular job regular job works so these three factors are something which uh, you know really helped us and uh, i would recommend these uh, whenever we are planning uh, to proceed with something like this in future as well thanks abhishek i hear from you and nidhi both that quality assurance is one of the key areas that both of you pro, you know put a lot of emphasis on because that is what the product goes to the market and that is how these incomes are assured did you ever encounter a a, a chance where you had to balance the gender impact with business outcomes or did you always feel that the gender impact was leading to better business outcomes this is the second question that we have here a lot of times when we go and meet our customers they are always asking us that why don't you put a sortex why don't you automate this this is going to be much better and um, they they just want to eliminate uh, women from our supply chain because what matters to them is that uh, today with uh, with a sortex machine or with automation they know that uh, their quality is assured they at least have greater probability so helping them move and go through this entire journey was very important for us that uh, they also have to start looking uh, we have to first prove ourselves that the quality that we give is same and that's where we ask them for a chance that uh, we make uh, ginger powder and uh, we ask them for this chance that okay you can test the product you can test for all your parameters and if we fail then we will also relook at what we need to do and um, we we can today match their samples uh, what they expect uh, so they are also now urging their other vendors to not go through 
uh, automotive some of the automotive pro, uh, process but also give a chance to a more decentralized women operated approach because uh, to our, to their surprise this was a big surprise for them that first time uh, in a, it, they are responsible for all their certifications uh, processes to be followed this was done so uh, for us uh, we also travel that journey uh, with them we also try to make our systems more robust we integrated iot in our machines where uh, the quality is more intuitive uh, women have to only do certain part of it so all three of us our customers our micro entrepreneurs and our team travel this journey and to our surprise we were able to meet it with some of the products and now we are now we are more experienced to replicate it across product lines categories so we are more have more awareness and uh, that's how we are more moving more towards more specialized products so if if this answers your question thanks nidhi and uh, i was getting this feeling that you know me and nidhi are in working in the same company so we we felt exactly the same thing in our textile business as well that's true yeah i think the the core problems remain the same and that is why learning and capturing it is so important right because what has worked for someone else may just work for for us as well so i think this is why we need to have more and more of these conversations uh, bringing uh, women together i think there is a bit of echo yeah i can hear it now that is why i think we need to have more of such conversations uh, bringing all the thought leaders in this space together to learn from each other what has worked what has not worked and with that note as we are nearing towards the end of this session with all your thought provoking uh, uh, exciting stories and conversations that you've shared with me i would give a chance for final thoughts around the table before i wrap up adrita sasmita would you like to add something here sure uh, shipra thank you for running an excellent session and to all the other panelists who joined us as well um i think just finally i'd like to say you know if you're thinking of entering the space uh, please do there's lots happening here there's a lot of innovation um we we're, we're looking for partners uh, every day when we started power program we were thinking of doing an accelerator for uh, women uh, owned businesses or you know where women were the co-founders and we were really worried that we wouldn't get a lot of applications when we sort of had a call for proposals uh, and we were hoping that you know at least we would get 10 and then the accelerator could take off uh we got 130 proposals uh from women working on uh, both gender and energy so there's a lot of innovation in this space it just needs more support so please uh do come forward thanks shipra thank you adrita i completely echo your thoughts uh sasmita any final thoughts yeah i think i would i would like to echo adrita's sentiment uh, and and just say two very quick things to everybody who's thinking about um is on the fence and thinking about whether they want to integrate this meaningfully in their work or not uh, i would say don't focus on the barriers alone focus on the agency of women um there's a lot of that uh, to think that women have no agency and and don't have and and are only about barriers is actually a very limited perspective of the lives uh, we live so there's a lot of agency and that agency can be really good uh, for you to leverage on it's just about opportunities like for any of us irrespective of gender it's about creating that opportunity uh, and as the sector which is supposed to be hopeful which is supposed to be the uh, the pioneers uh, let's start from a place of trust that it is possible and then uh, see what kind of impacts we are able to see um, and secondly i would say if you uh, want to um, pilot experiment uh, start with something small uh, start with a pilot talk to people in the sector there are enough of us today who have um tried this who have had conversations to make this work and we are always open to kind of sharing those ideas and very candid uh, ideas about what doesn't work as well um so start small start with a pilot uh, and then you can you can gradually grow because i think the path to growth might be different for different kinds of organizations 
um, but I think there's nothing stopping us from doing that small pilot, that small uh, experiment to begin with. Yeah, I think those are the two things. I would Thank you, Sashmita. Nidhi, any thoughts, final thoughts from you? Uh, no, just that we need more supporters like Shell Foundation and FCDO at various stages, at uh, at early, at growth stage. And uh, that's how it has worked for us. I hope uh, more donors can come on the same platform, with, which, is, which does not only mean grant funding or equity funding, but more debt, banks, everyone comes together and is aligned and can take inspiration from the work done by other stakeholders um, and uh, and get along, get on the and the on the boat and uh, do this collectively for for all our women. Thank you, Nidhi. And Abhishek, any final thoughts from you? I feel that I joined at the final thought <laughs> level, but yeah. Uh, see here, I think uh, uh, apart from whatever uh, Sashmita and Nidhi added here. Uh, the role of government is also very important uh, at this stage. And, you know, whatever schemes or whatever uh, plans they have, uh, you know, they are being welcoming to startups like us or uh, initiatives like uh, uh, such, such focus initiatives like others. Uh, it's very important that, you know, what exactly uh, they also can provide where, you know, uh, whatever, what Nidhi was saying that the banks, financial institutions, and other uh, uh, stakeholders can also uh, come into the picture with confidence that you know uh, this is this is going to work because we have government support as well absolutely i think this is a very um, exciting area to play in where we all currently sit at the nexus of gender energy climate and we all have a role to play in this, right? To make gender inclusion real as donors, as program architects, as social enterprises, as financial institutions, or as policymakers and uh, the government bodies, as you mentioned. This does require a holistic and a sustainable approach to weave uh, women across the entire value chain, like we discussed, not just as end users, but also as leaders and founders and empowering them with asset ownership so that they can flourish as a leader because when one woman grows, the entire community flourishes, right? At Shell Foundation as well, we are committed to gender inclusion and follow a very high touch approach to enterprise building and gender integration. Uh, jointly with FCDO, we have supported various enterprises in integrating gender lens across energy as well as in sustainable mobility. Some of these strategies have led to micro entrepreneurs now earning three to 600 rupees per day from almost close to zero income earlier. And we've also seen examples where income of micro entrepreneurs has doubled across Maharashtra and Odisha through targeted gender interventions. So we also encourage other donors who share this commitment uh, towards uh, gender inclusion to collaborate, come forward and support some of these enterprises, because I think there is sufficient evidence now available on the business value of gender inclusion and why we should do this. I think the question that we should be asking us, ourselves now is why not? Yeah. And I heard uh, Mrs. Lakshmi Puri in, uh, say earlier in one of the sessions today that if we want to make India rich before India gets old, we have to empower our young women and we have to increase their participation in the workforce to tap into our demographic dividend and they make 50% of it, right? And this is by no means an easy win and that is why we need more conversations like these. We need all the players to act together and support more entrepreneurs like Nidhi and Abhishek to make it real on the ground. Thank you very much for your time, everyone. And thank you very much for my panelists for answering the questions so nicely. This has been a very enriching and thought-provoking session for me. And I hope you enjoyed it too. I wish you a very happy Independence Day in advance and have a good evening ahead. Thank you, Shukra. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.